idea. But at 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 13, it says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. Well, in a report released just earlier this month, May 2020, Germany's Council of Catholic Bishops, after decades of seeming ambivalence, they have finally admitted to the church's complicity in the actions of the Nazi regime during World War II. In a 23-page document by the council, the council states, inasmuch as the bishops did not oppose the war with a clear no, and most of them bolstered the German nation's will to endure, they made themselves complicit in the war. So the, the Council of Bishops in Germany is pretty much admitting here that during World War II, they should have opposed their German government, but they didn't, at least not clearly and, and mostly not at all. And failing to do that, they are admitting here pretty much that they are guilty of bolstering the atrocities of Nazis in Germany and in much of the world at the time. It seems that the Council of Bishops is pretty much saying, yes, as followers of Jesus, we should have rebelled against our governing authorities. Now, this admission coming from a group of leaders within the Christian faith might seem a little shocking in light of what we learned from the scriptures last week. So in case you missed it or in case you need a little refresher, we talked about last week about how the Apostle Paul addresses the Christian's responsibility toward government in Romans chapter 13 by writing, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. It is necessary to submit to the authorities. And we discussed last week how this is God's word telling followers of Jesus to be respectful and obedient to our governments, to willingly place ourselves under their authority, because after all, as scripture told us, their authority is ordained by God. And yet here we have the Council of Catholic Bishops in Germany seemingly coming together and saying, yeah, we should have disobeyed our government during the war. And so that causes us to maybe stop and think, huh? But I have to admit that probably for most of us, we were already a little uncomfortable with this idea of always obeying the government authorities. I mean, always, always, no matter what our government might demand out of us. What if we're subject of an unjust government, a cruel government that doesn't care at all for its people? What if the government demands that we do something we know God doesn't want us to do? Or what if the government doesn't allow us to do stuff that God tells us is good to be out there doing? So in our minds, we seem to think that God must give us some form of limitations on this directive. And we are right in think of, thinking that. God does. God, you see, God's word, it's not pie-in-the-sky stuff. It's not just God writing stuff saying, oh, okay, in an ideal world, this is how it would all be. So, so this is what it's going to be. No, God knows we are fallen, sinful humans. And he knows that because of our sin, this world is a fallen, fallen place where, where bad things happen. And therefore, he knows that we're going to mess up even the good things he puts in place for us, including government. He knows it's not always going to be perfect. You know, the Word of God is very real in the fact that although government is ordained by God, government always doesn't work the way God wants it to work. God's Word is real in saying that there will be wicked and unjust rulers. In Proverbs 29.2, look at it, it says, when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. Even more in Psalm chapter 58, verses 1 and 2, it says, Do you rulers indeed speak justly? Do you judge uprightly among men? And no, in your heart you devise injustice, and your hands mete out violence on the earth. See, given the wickedness of some government officials that these verses indicate we are going to at least sometimes encounter in this world, it can be difficult to fully understand what Paul means when he tells believers to be subject to governing authorities. It seems that there are times when civil disobedience is called for. And in fact, there are actually quite a few biblical precedents for civil disobedience in the Old Testament alone. I mean, Exodus, the Egyptian handmaidens uh, are told by Pharaoh to kill all the Hebrews Hebrew boys as they are born. The handmaidens don't do that. They're not going to just kill babies. That's wicked. 
Soldiers disobey King Saul, king of Israel, when he orders them to kill innocent priests. The prophet Obadiah disobeyed the queen of Israel by hiding away the prophets of God when the queen, who was very wicked, was set on killing them all. Probably most notable to all of us, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they disobeyed the king of Babylon when he ordered them to pray only to a golden idol. And we know the story, most of us, that they got thrown into a fiery furnace for disobeying. But we have these examples and many more in the Old Testament, and it seems that all the people in these examples rebelled against the governing authorities when those authorities demanded that they do something that God forbids or when those authorities forbade something that God commands that we go and do. So we take all these examples and we come to a theology of what it means to obey our governing authorities, but at the same time, disobeying when we need to. R.C. Sproul, our Reformed theologian, sums up the biblical mandate for obedience to civil authorities by writing, any time a civil government requires a Christian to do what God forbids or forbids them to do what God commands, then the person must disobey. But our basic posture toward government, according to the New Testament, is to be submissive and obedient citizens of the state. So as followers of Jesus, our default attitude toward our government officials is to be submissive and obedient. That's just where we should start. How about that, right? But if or when our government or government officials expect or demand that we do something against what God has told us is right, then it is our duty to resist. It's not only an option, it's our duty. Now, we don't resist just because we don't like something or someone. We don't resist just because we think, hey, that might lead to something that, that might be bad. No. But we must resist when or if our government calls us to participate in unjust activities, according to what God says is justice. See, that's another reason why it's so important to know our scriptures. We know our scriptures so we can know when it is appropriate to resist. And so we can know with confidence when we must resist. So there will be times when, when people of faith will be called upon to resist their government. Again, not always, and, and probably few and far between. But the question in those times is, how do we do that without degrading into total anarchy? Because that's not what we want either, right? We don't want just a total lack of all order. So how do we do it? Well, I found five principles while studying over these past couple weeks within Scripture that can help guide us if we are ever called upon to resist an unjust government. So right now, maybe our government's doing something unjust, and you're like, how, how do I respond to that? Well, these pointers will help us today. The first principle, nonviolently resist, but only when it's necessary. Two things in here about resistance. Do it nonviolently. But do it only when it is necessary. You see, we resist when the government's commands conflict with God's commands. Remember, that's our duty then. This is what we see Daniel doing in Daniel chapter 6 in the Old Testament. To give you some background for those of you who don't know it, a lot of the king's advisors didn't like that Persian king Darius was favoring Daniel among his advisors. They felt threatened by Daniel. So they got cooked up this plan. They instructed the king to issue an edict that no one in the entire kingdom can pray to any god or any human except the king over the next 30 days. Because they knew Daniel was committed to his god, the one true god. They knew Daniel wouldn't stop praying, so we're going to get him. So, duped by his advisors in this manner, the king signs that edict into law in such a way that it could not be altered, it could not be rescinded, it could not be revoked. So the king passes this law, which pretty much outlaws praying to God in any and all locations, public and private. See, it's an unjust law. It's telling people to stop doing something that God has commanded them to do. So what does Daniel do? Well, we read about his response in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. You see, when, when, when the authorities commanded Daniel to stop doing something God had commanded him to do, Daniel disobeyed the civil authorities. But he did it peacefully, without violence. He didn't go after the king, did he? No. He just went about doing the thing that God had commanded him to do. But be warned, when he disobeyed the civil authorities, he was punished for it. I mean, Daniel was unjustly thrown into a lion's den. Many of us know this story. 
because he had peacefully resisted the unjust orders of the authorities. We see something similar in Acts chapter 5. The New Testament, the apostles are, are, are brought in before the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin is the ruling council of the Jewish people in Jerusalem in that day. So it's like they're the ruling authorities there, right? And so the apostles are brought in before them. Why? Well, because previously the apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin had ordered the apostles to stop talking about Jesus. Now, the disciples knew that Jesus had commanded them to go and make disciples out of all people everywhere. Tell everyone about Jesus. Because that's what he had commanded them to do. So, of course, they didn't stop telling people about Jesus, right? So they're brought before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest says, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And that's when Peter and the other apostles, they give the great answer that is so telling to us on this topic. Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. We must obey God before human beings. See, when the government authorities demand of us, what they demand of us is in conflict with what God has demanded of us. We must obey God rather than human beings. And that's what the apostles did. But notice, even as they resist, they do it peacefully. The, the apostles don't declare war on the Sanhedrin or try to overthrow their authority. In fact, they, they never do that at any point. They, they just accept the punishment that the Sanhedrin gives them. They're beaten for disobeying the civil authority of the Sanhedrin. But then they leave peacefully. They go and continue to tell people about Jesus. They do it in peace, knowing that further reprisal may come. You see, we're not guaranteed that we won't be punished when we uh, resist civil authorities. But you see, there's no battle, neither of weapons nor of even words. So uh, the biblical principle of nonviolent disobedience, it is one of the things that undergirded the civil rights movement in this nation and made it successful. You want to see someplace where behaving biblically like this works, we see it working in the civil rights movement. As Martin Luther King Jr., an American Baptist, by the way, and probably the movement's best known leader, as he wrote, true nonviolent protest is not unrealistic submission to evil power. It is rather a courageous confrontation of evil by the power of love in which faith that it is better to be the recipient of violence than inflictor of it. Since the latter only multiplies the existence of violence and bitterness in the universe, while the former may develop a sense of shame in the opponent and thereby bring about a transformation and change of heart. And that's what we're after. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, our position in all things, even in in opposing evil civil authorities or unjust civil authorities, it must be to glorify God. That's what we're always after. If God is not glorified in our disobedience by a hope to inspire transformation and a change of heart, if God's not glorified, then we are doing it wrong or we shouldn't be doing it at all. See, we must be after God's glory. Our hope, even in opposing our civil authorities, must always be that all would experience that change of heart and come to saving faith in our Lord Jesus. Because after coming to that saving faith, that changes the heart, that changes actions, and changes unjust behavior. We might need to resist, but, but we do it peacefully and nonviolently. The second principle, keep obeying. You know, we saw the Apostle Paul last week in Romans 13 say, uh, be submissive to the authorities. And we see Peter, the Apostle Peter this time, teaching it again in today's passage in 1 Peter 2, 13, 14, when he writes, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. You see, again, we have this command to submit to human authorities, specifically here to emperor and governors, those under the emperor. You know, it's very clear. Peter is talking about submitting to civil authorities here. And this is written by the apostle uh, Peter, who, uh, about whom tradition indicates to us, was imprisoned for nine months in Rome before being crucified upside down by Emperor Nero. He would have been about 70 years old at the time. So it seems rational to expect that Peter knew ahead of that, that yes, the emperor and the governors, the civil authorities, they could be cruel and unjust. But he still commands believers to submit to them nonetheless. See, we come back to this idea again and again and again because I think this is the first place we're prone to falter in our response to unjust government action. We think, well, uh, the government is unjust in this thing over here. 
that I don't agree with, so I'm going to disobey with them here. And then since we disobey them here, we think it's okay to disobey in this here and this here and this here because after all, they're doing something wrong over here. And you see it spreads. It doesn't take long for pockets of justified resistance to spread to outright disobedience on many levels. It's like being on a diet, right? You cheat or you disobey the confines of your diet on just one little area and what happens? It's just so easy to keep disobeying uh, in this other area and to disobey again and dis disobey again to keep cheating and cheating and cheating. This was me on Easter, ladies and gentlemen. Many of you know I was on a diet to lose some weight, right? And I was doing really well leading up to Easter. I'd actually gotten to my goal weight by Easter. So I was happy and I decided, hey, since Easter is such a great celebration, let's make it a full celebration. I'm going to take a cheat day on Easter. I'm just going to have whatever I want to celebrate, right? So I decided to have lots of good stuff that I hadn't normally been eating for our big Easter lunch, including some of my sister's party potatoes. And they were really good, had some of those. And then I thought, well, since uh, I'm having all this other good stuff with my meal, I might as well have a piece of cake for dessert. And since I'm having a piece of cake, I might as well have a big piece of cake. And since I had a piece of cake, I might as well have some of this Easter candy. And since I had some of the Easter candy, I might as well just eat it all. And since I had cake for dessert after lunch and had all that candy, I might as well have another piece of cake before going to bed. And since I'm having another piece of cake, I might as well have another big piece of cake. This is so me, isn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, that's how you put on four pounds in one day. But you see, you cheat or you disobey and it's just one little place and it, and it just carries over and all those all other areas and you just keep getting more and more off track. You see, if we are ever called by God's justice to resist our governing authorities in one place, well, that can make it easy to think uh, to ourselves that it's okay to disobey in other places even when justice doesn't call for it there. So we're told over and over and over and over again, you know, no, keep obeying the civil authorities and all these other places. We're told it again. We read it again in the third place. The Apostle Paul writes about it again in the book of Titus. Uh, Paul's writing to his protege Titus in, in chapter 3, verse 1 of that book. Paul writes, remind the people. Again, we need to be reminded. Remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. See, when we are called to injustice by our government, we may need to resist government authorities in that place. But beyond that situation, the message is clearly to continue submitting and obeying. We may not like everything our government does with, say, our taxes, but we must pay our taxes. We may not like what our government is doing or saying about immigration. But that doesn't give us the freedom to just go out and disobey the government in all other places, uh, such as traffic laws. No. You know, we may need to resist in place, but overall, the second principle, keep obeying. The third principle, pray for our governing authorities. Pray. Paul writes about this in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Timothy is another one of his protégés. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes to him, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. See, if you want to change injustice being carried out by our government, pray for your governing officials. This is one of the easiest, most effective things you can do. You see, during our worship time together, you often see me, you hear me praying for our political leaders, if not by name, then at least by position or title, because that's what we are instructed to do here. And so that's what I do. I make sure we all pray together. But I once had a woman who, who was very politically minded during the term of a president she was very much opposed to tell me that it was difficult for her at first to pray for that person in office. She didn't want to do it. She didn't want to pray for them. But then over time, she realized, well, that's exactly what she's supposed to be doing. That's exactly what she needs to be doing. Praying for her government leader, even the ones she opposed. See, this is perhaps one of the greatest services we can do for those in leadership who are unjust or misguided. More than ranting on Facebook or posting a sign or swearing about them when we're with like-minded friends, praying for them is the most powerful thing we can do to affect their change. And yet most of us ignore this. It's to our own loss because notice that according to this verse, praying for them comes with a personal benefit, right? Paul, in writing to Timothy, he says, we will experience peace to live with God. 
because Paul knows, hey, God's going to answer our prayers for our authorities. And ultimately, that will lead to them to change. And it's going to lead to them changing what they're doing and changing circumstances, which will lead to us experiencing the peace we desire and that we need to live our lives for Christ. So we pray for government officials. Our, Our third principle, don't forget that one. Fourth principle, preserve goodness. Make sure goodness is known. Make sure people know what goodness is. You see, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus calls his followers the salt of the earth. And then a few verses later, he tells us that we are the light of the world. We are to preserve and flavor the world with Christ's love, the same way salt preserves and flavors food. And we are to light up the world with Christ's love. We are are to, to shine Christ's light into any and all situations that have any darkness in them. That's what we're called to do. And one of the ways we can bring that salt and we can bring that light to the world is by speaking out against against injustice that might be perpetrated by our governing authorities. You see, we shed light on it. Our God is a God of justice. And so in speaking against injustice and speaking how God feels about it, we bring his light and his love into the situation. And and, uh, praise God, we are blessed to live in a society that allows us to do this freely, ladies and gentlemen. We can discuss with others when and how our government is acting unjustly. We can write letters of objection. In some cases, we can petition the courts. We can take to the media to express our perspective, which better be the perspective of Christ. And we can organize and march peacefully to declare to the world what justice is or isn't in a particular situation. We can do all those things, but we need to make sure that as we do them, we're preserving goodness. We need to make sure that when we're doing this, we know what the scriptures say about this topic and how it applies to what we are speaking about. What does God say is good? You see, we don't light the world for Christ by merely speaking out in objection to what we personally dislike or would like to see, but by speaking God's perspective into a situation. If it's not God's perspective, then it's just us babbling. Who cares? Who cares what you say? Who cares what I say? A Christian teacher, Wesley Baines, writes it like this. When a Christian resists authority, he or she must not have harm in mind, but help. Protest to make life better for those negatively affected by our country's leaders. March to raise awareness of misconduct or to show younger generations that this conduct is wrong, despite it coming from a leader. Write and speak to point out injustice. Do these things in love and change happens. Do these things out of anger, and you will only be met with equal anger, and maybe worse. So, hey, we need to preserve goodness, even as we are resisting. And that brings us to our fifth and final principle, which is kind of a continuation of the last one. Don't only preserve goodness, but show goodness. We need to show goodness. Don't be content to merely speak about goodness and justice, but you go do it. You go live it. Change people's perspective, even the, that of our governing authorities, by doing good, by showing them what that good is. You see, when our government is killing babies or at least allowing it to happen and partially funding it, we should be doing more than just opposing it and, and talking about it. As people who follow Jesus, we should be caring for pregnant women and their uh, new babies and new moms. See, that's showing goodness. See, when our government isn't caring for orphans and widows and foreigners, immigrants, as we are commanded in God's word to do over and over and over again, honestly, people, it's very clear what God's perspective is on this. If our government isn't doing it, then the people of the church should step forward and do it. We need to stop expecting our government to take care of it and go show goodness. See, so often uh, we, we think that we have done our Christian duty merely by voicing opposition to politicians and political policies that miss the mark on these types of things. But really, merely complaining about them does little to nothing, right? You can spout off it all you want, you haven't changed anything. And it often results in the world seeing the opposite of good. You know, I won't know a woman who attended the March for Life in Washington, D.C. once. March for Life is every January, people get together to protest our government's policy on abortion and killing unborn babies. But this, this woman went down there to participate in that once uh, and said she'd never go back. She said the attitude of so many who were there supposedly to stand up for justice and to oppose unjust government policies, she said their attitude was just anger and hatred and retribution 
And that's probably not reflective of the attitude of everyone or maybe even most of those people who go to the March for Life, but the pockets that she saw, that's what she saw. And she said that there were women there to bring their young daughters out in front of them and saying, this is who you're killing. See, that's not showing goodness. If God calls us to be salt and light, and he does, then that means he calls us to be his hands and feet to go, to stop sitting in our homes and our pews and just saying this is what we think should be, but to actually go and love in the name of Jesus those who aren't being cared for or those who are victims of injustice. When our governing authorities fail to carry out justice or even have policies that are unjust, then it is the work of Christ's followers to resist them by going out and carrying out justice for them. Don't just complain about what your government is or isn't doing, but go. You go. Give of your time, give of your money, give of your life to do what you believe our government should be doing. If the government isn't feeding the poor, you feed the poor that the world might see the love of, uh, of Christ, the light of Christ, and the justice you spread. That's showing goodness, the goodness of Christ. And as Peter wrote in today's scripture lesson, it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence ignorant talk of foolish people. We can all agree that there are many foolish people out there talking. How can we silence them? <sighs> by going and doing good. If there are foolish people speaking in our government, how, how, how can we resist them? By going and doing good. There they are. Five principles for the person of faith to resist unjust government expectations. You see, we're all called by God to submit ourselves to our governing authorities. But God's word does recognize that there will be times when we must resist. When our government brings about injustice and demands that we participate in it, then we must disobey. But given God's word tells us over and over and over again clearly to be subjected to the authorities... We better make sure any resistance we put up is in line with what God calls justice. Not what we call justice, not what some group or political party calls justice, but what God calls justice. And when God uh, calls for justice, then and only then do we stand against our governing authority. You know, as we remember this Memorial Day weekend, the men and women who fought and died to maintain the freedom we have in this country, we recognize how blessed we are to have that freedom. And so my prayer is that we would act in that freedom today to respect our governing authorities, that we would act in that freedom to pray for our governing authorities, and we would act in that freedom to do God's good for and beyond our governing authorities. Let's pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for loving us, and we thank you for loving us in such a way but by giving us a governing authority to maintain order and to do those things for us that we can't do for ourselves, God. And we just know that's you watching out for us, God. But we know sometimes governments, like all of us, are imperfect, and sometimes they do unjust things or maybe call us to unjust things. And sometimes governments try to prevent people from doing good or, or, or try to force people to do things we know you tell us not to. And so God, we know that at those times we must disobey. God, help us to have wisdom so that we can discern when those times are, that it's not just our attitude or our opinions getting in the way and interjecting, but help us to know God where you are truly saying justice is not being done and then help us to resist in those places. God, help us to do it peacefully and, and nonviolently, but with wisdom. Uh, help us uh, as we do that, Father, to, to, to maintain order and obey in other places, God. And put your spirit upon us that we would continually be praying for those uh, who are over us in, in authority. Because we know only by your wisdom can they truly be successful in what you call them to do, God. And through it all, God, may we seek to see your goodness done. May we speak goodness into this world. Not hate, not anger, but goodness. And may we go do it. All by way of resisting any injustice that we see in this world. And we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.